All right, welcome everybody to our virtual Monday lunch. We've got a very special guest this week with us. Uh, before we get to him, we're going to get an update from Bill Hill, class of 84. How you doing, Bill? Howdy, Ags. What a uh, great uh, day today is, Monday the 12th, and what a great weekend it was, especially for football and, and the, and the uh, Texas Aggies. Um, hey, Logan, you were at the game. Were, were you not? I was at the game. Uh, it was fantastic. It was. Uh, it was my, my – I took my son. It was his first – Aggie football game and what an experience uh, to share that with him. That was a big win. Well, maybe uh, Jackie can tell us about some of his big wins a little bit later on. But I got to tell you, Texas A&M football is back. Uh, uh, I had an opportunity to get some really uh, good seats, and I had my son, Captain William Hill, uh, the fourth in attendance with my son-in-law and my wife. It was fantastic. And, and what was – what was great was, um, you know, the student section was pretty much, uh, it was really full. Maybe it was at 50%, maybe it was uh, somewhere more or less than that. But really, the, uh, the alumni section where I sat in, there was no one within 10 feet of me. And we, I was on the 42-yard line on the 11th roll. So um, they really did a good job of social distancing from that standpoint. But where the band was, where the, uh, where the core block was, where the student section was, it was fantastic. And there's no doubt in my mind that the student section, the fans in the uh, stadium threw the Florida uh, football team off. And it, we really looked great the whole time. What a beautiful day for college football. Anyway, uh, Logan, I'm sure you had a great time too. Man, it was, uh, it was a blast. It, you know, it's always good to see the Aggies uh, pick up a big win and uh, to see it at home and, um, you know, hopefully the crowd continues, crowd size gets bigger and bigger, and we uh, just keep building on this momentum, and uh, it was it was a fun game to be in. Well, uh, I know Coach Cheryl will share with his, uh, his thoughts. I want to give you a quick uh, Monday uh, lunch news update. For those that participated in the Coaches Night uh, a couple weeks ago, um, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we had over 300 participants online. It was a virtual event, and uh, there's a lot of things that we did. One of the things we did was we had an online auction. That auction has closed. However, we still have a raffle. I'll do explain this. Uh, there is uh, a chance to win $5,000. And all you do is you buy one ticket for $100. Only 300 tickets will be sold. So that means you have one in 300 chance to win $5,000 with just a $100 donation. To, to uh, figure out more about that, go to our website. And you'll see all the details on Coach's Night and that, uh, that raffle. Um, speaking of the website and other uh, fundraisers we're doing, Fiesta medals have been, um, are in. Of course, Fiesta was canceled this year. And I took my Fiesta medal to, uh, to the game. And I was in the MSC afterwards. And I saw a Parsons Mounted Cavalry off, uh, officer there, a senior, I stopped and talked to her for a while, and I ended up giving my medal away. So, Logan, do you have a picture of this medal? They're really classy. I've got one. Let me see if I can get it to show up uh, right there. Look at that. Parsons Mounted Cavalry. Beautiful medal. Anyway, anyway the Car Parsons Mounted Cavalry do a great job of supporting the team and, and as ambassadors across uh, Texas, United States, and I hope you'll find an opportunity to get one of these collector item Fiesta medals. They're only $10, and we'll even mail them to you. See our website for more details. Hey, look, uh, real important here, uh, the board of directors is uh, something that uh, is that executive leadership that runs a club every year. It's a great opportunity to serve San Antonio and the A&M club, as well as just fellowship with Aggies all over the place. Our board of director nominations are due, well, today, Monday the, tw uh, the 12th. And I have to tell you, it's been really hard to outreach to some of the members out there. And I believe we're still looking to fill one slot. So there is an opportunity here to serve the San Antonio a and Club. We need some more volunteers. And so again, please go to our website. You can get the uh, application and fill it in. Um, and we'll go from there. Look, let me give you a, a capital campaign update. You guys know we've reported extensively that we need to raise $1.6 million to renovate Aggie Park and expand it. And we're going to expand it 30 feet plus add an addition for outside uh, uh, covered, uh, covered seating. And in order to do that, we got to win 1.6. Now, fortunately, we have a $450,000 uh, 
matching grant from the Mays Family Foundation. And we have matched quite a bit of that. In fact, we are now uh, raised a total counting their, their match donations, $1,127,735. Since I last reported a couple weeks ago, uh, we've received a $10,000 pledge from Richard Wilson. Um, that was immediately matched by the Mays Family Foundation. And just in the last week alone, we've got $3,000 of new donations, which was also matched by the Mays Family Foundation. So again, we're, we're nearing 1.2 million. We got to get to that 1.6. Really, uh, we really only need about, uh, it was about 23,000, uh, $230,000 left and then we'll be matched by the Mays Foundation. So if you have it in the, and you can find the ability to, to donate 100, 1,000, 10,000, or pledge some combination of that, we'd really appreciate it. Hey, the next big events is the Sporting Clays Tournament at the San Antonio a &M Club. That's October 30th. It's an outdoor event. We will have lunch served there. It's always a fantastic, fun event, especially with COVID and all the uh, cooped in activities on the inside that we cannot do. This is just the perfect opportunity to share and fellowship with Aggie. So go to our website, join, uh, join with your team and uh, contribute to the San Antonio a &M Club. One of the other fundraisers we have is a meal guy hunt. Uh, 250 tickets will be sold for a chance to hunt meal guy at the West uh, uh, Foundation, West Family Foundation down in South Texas. Uh, Neil Guy is a beautiful animal, but they're great eating. The tickets are only $25 each. So again, go to the website. It's a fundraiser for the San Antonio a &M Club. As you know, we're doing a couple of fundraisers, but we really, uh, we're, we're, you know, we really need your help in, in uh, keeping the club uh, moving forward with a great vision that we have for next year. Hey, I've got some good news. Um, tentatively, we are planning to meet on Monday uh, October 19th with limited, atten uh, limited attendance at Aggie Park. Okay, so we're still sorting out how that's going to go. Much like Kyle Field, we think we're going to have limited uh, seating, maybe at 25%. We'd ask you to go ahead and RSVP in advance. You can do that by going to AggiePark.com and RSVP on the event page. And we will position people where they can be socially distanced. We'll have a lunch. We don't know the uh, total numbers on that, but you can plan on being there October 19th. It's a first come first serve on the sign up. And uh, as we work through this, we will also be live streaming the Monday lunch in person. So, uh, so if you can't be in person, you can, you can attend also virtually like you're doing right now. And we'll have that saved on the website. If you can't, if you can't watch it on Monday lunch, you can watch it Tuesday afterwards. So I'm just going to close by saying, uh, you know, we're going to open up Aggie Park. We're going to see how that works, much like Kyle Field. The things that are in limbo right now are the events in December. So normally we have a, a Christmas, a club Christmas party about mid-December. We've got to see how that goes because it's typically inside at night. And a lot of our attendees are the older crowd. And again, and again we're going to be talking about that in the next couple of weeks as we work through this. Don't know about Sunday with Santa as well, but more to follow, and we'll be giving you club updates. So, Logan, I'm going to turn it over to you and Coach uh, Cheryl. So, that's your update for uh, for Monday the 12th. All right. Well, thanks, Bill. Uh, as as Bill mentioned, our guest today is Jackie Cheryl. He's uh, he's won a couple of national titles on the field. He's won a national title as a coach. He's coached at Washington State, Pittsburgh. Texas A&M, Mississippi State. He's been coach of the year. Uh, he's got numerous accolades. Uh, and his, every time you see a, a walk-on running down the field covering the kicks, uh, you get to see a bit of his lasting legacy that he's had at Texas A&M uh, when he formed the Texas A&M kickoff, the uh, 12th man kickoff team. Uh, so I'd like to welcome our guest, Coach Jackie Sherrill. How you doing, sir? I, doing great, Logan. And, and all of us are happy today after <laughs> that win yesterday and how they played and especially how mine played. Mine played extremely well. Uh, and that comes back or goes back to coaching. You know, there's three or four things in the game. One is the performance of mine, but two, the performance of the offensive line 
You know, when you rush for 205 yards and then hold your opponent to 90, then you won the battle in the trenches. So you have to really take your hats off. And certainly our little kicker, uh, it was pretty good yesterday because he was 100% on all extra points and field goals, but the big one at the end of the game. And, you know, you go into the game of, of trying not to lose the game. That meaning, you know, you're going to try, you're going to play to win. But there's so many times and so many coaches make decisions where they actually lose the game, then making sure they, they don't lose the game in some of the play calling or an example is when Jimbo let the clock run all the way down, uh, you either win it or lose it. And uh, he had faith enough in the, uh, our kicker and, and the kicker came through for him. But going back to Mond, when you were 25 for 35 and at 71%, uh, that's pretty good. No interceptions, three touchdowns. But the, and the big thing is I think that they finally found what Mond can do. And when I say that, as a quarterback to execute, but you got to give them help. And some of the issues that mine had wasn't all his fault. However, as a quarterback, you get blamed for all of the, the issues. But the game yesterday, and if mine will play or can play, and if, if the, and I, it comes back to Jimbo, if he puts him in those positions and ask him to, to do the things that he was able to do yesterday, uh, then we have a chance to win the next seven games. And if that happens, you know, fast forward, if you can, and all these wishing, wanting, and, but we got to do it first. But, you know, there's a chance going down. And if we can win out, uh, then we'll be in the playoff because that means you're going to be nine and uh, nine and one and, uh, anybody 91 and only losing to Alabama will be that fourth team. Well, I, I sure hope you're right. Uh, it, it definitely looked like a little bit uh, different football team out there. What, what do you think the biggest difference was between just last week and this week? Well, again, uh, and you can see this all over the country, uh, i.e. Mississippi State. You know, they played – LSU, LSU is not as good as they have been, especially in the secondary. But they played man all night long. They never played zone. They never changed up. Then the second game they played with Arkansas, Mississippi State, uh, the quarterback was not the same because they were playing zone, drop, uh, rushing three, dropping eight. And all of a sudden, then here comes Kentucky, and Kentucky changed and played a combination of zone, man, uh, but the quarterback performance. Now it comes back, were you asking that quarterback to do certain things? And then in Mike Leach's offense, uh, that quarterback, one, has to be able to process before the ball and as the ball is snapped to get the ball to where it's supposed to go. And if there's any hesitation at all, uh, then the play is not good. Now you go back to Mond. I feel the same thing with, with Mond uh, early in his career, meaning part of last year and in a couple of games this year, that he was not processing quick enough. And that's where I, you have to give Jimbo all the credit because uh, – they asked him to process and gave him reads that helped him make the decision early after the snap. Uh, you, you, you brought up Jimbo Fisher a couple of times. Y'all have, got, y'all have quite a bit in common in terms of uh, coming to A&M and signing big time deals. I know. Yours was the first. Hey, mine wasn't anywhere near. It's about 74. <laughs> <Not a million. laughs> 
uh, it was the best of it, the best contract in the country when you signed it and uh and Jim well Bob there was there were there were some other coaches that were making more but uh, they were private and Joe Paterno was one of them so but there and no one ever made more than coach Bryant uh, even when coach Bryant was at A&M his con originally played so many games in Houston and Dallas and then at Alabama while we played so many games in Birmingham coach Bryant's contract he got a percentage of the gate so I, I don't know of any coach out there that's getting a percentage of the gate today. Hey, that's a that's a pretty good that'd be a pretty good deal at Kyle Field with 110,000 when they found oh, yeah. Well, just I mean, just you know, everybody's losing right now, uh, and you know the the whole country and the whole world has has been affected by COVID-19. What has affected and go back to Kyle field and what it has done to the community or the games because if you took the multiplying effect let's just say you have a hundred thousand people at two hundred dollars that's including tickets gas meals what they were going to spend in that community then you multiply it times five because you know the people that are in the hotels that are running the restaurants they and I'm talking about the service people and all the people that worked at Kyle Field and all the people that were help all the outside of Kyle Field. That money went in back into the community and mortgages. It went back into, you know, food, clothing, um, I mean, gas, whatever. So you take, you know, how many people that are in the stands multiply it times 200, then multiply that times five, that's the economic impact on that college station, Bryan College Station, every football game. So now take 25% of that. that that's definitely, uh, that's a, a good way of looking at it is the impact that it brings on the community. It's kind of the, the lifeblood of the, of the community and the university. Uh, uh, yes. So, and the NCAA, they're they're making they're making some money off of off of all this too. Uh, well, not as not as much on football. Uh, you know that changed that years ago, and it was 1978 when Oklahoma and Georgia sued the NCAA for proprietary rights. It's very similar what the athlete athletes today are suing the NCAA for. Now, the NCAA has gone to Congress, they have asked for help, and they've fallen on deaf ears. Congress is not gonna help the NCAA. So I think that it's part of all the things that are happening. And, you know, they furloughed uh, 600 people. Now, in reality, how in the hell can the NCAA employ 600 people? You know, who's paying for that bankroll and who, or paychecks? Uh, who's paying for the insurance? On and on and on. And it comes right back to the universities, but it's really from the basketball in the final four. Uh, the best thing that's, this is my feeling, in my opinion, the best thing that has happened <clears throat> as a result from COVID and, you know, I'm not taking away how drastic it was, but it's giving the power five finally understanding they do not need the NCAA. They can have fall championships and they're going to have fall championships uh, and they can do all everything without giving any money to the NCAA. Now let's, reverse it and let's say the final four basketball, all that money came back to the universities where it should be, because they're the ones, then uh, it would be a windfall for everybody and a windfall more so for the group of five and division three. 
it would give them a lot more money in their pockets to have athletic uh, sports, men and women. So as of right now, the, the NCAA makes a lot of their money off of off the Final Four? Oh, I'm talking about billions. You know, if you, if you Google the NCAA and really dug and find out how much they had in escrow, uh, I want to say it's, it's in the billions they have in escrow. If you just dissolve the NCAA and put all that money back into the universities, that would be a windfall. That would be that would be a pretty big windfall. It sounds like um, you, you mentioned the playoffs. What do you think about the the fourteen playoff and and where is it headed? Or do you think that it needs to be expanded or done away with? How do you feel? Well, you know, right now there there are four teams when we get there, but do you dilute it if you expand it? You know, uh, I, we don't know yet. I don't know if, if there are eight teams, if number eight can play number one. So will you end up with a lot of lopsided games? Now, uh, I think that there's other ways in doing it. And the Big Ten uh, is doing it this year where Number one from the East plays number one from the West. Number two from the East plays number two from the West. And three plays number three and four plays number four. So in the conference, like the SEC, when you don't play everybody, and then all of a sudden at the end of the year, you could multiply that into a playoff system very simply if you took number one and number two from every conference and played that way. In other words, you'd have, you know, the five majors. So you'd have 10 teams and one plays 10, two plays nine and on and on and work out. I think UCF would be pretty disappointed in that. Not They are always uh, trying to get into the uh, national well, title talks. Yeah. Uh, if they haven't, shown where they can beat the the top four teams in the nation. I mean, they're good. Don't get me wrong. Uh, however, now in saying that, you give me the top two universities in the nation enrollment wise. Who, who are, is that? Uh, I think well, A&M's up there. The top two universities in the nation enrollment wise. Who would that be? Well, a and is number one. And number two is UCF, University of Central Florida. Oh, wow. And, you know, we, we thought. But it, going back real quickly, I mean, those, those two universities bounced back and forth. Uh, in the SEC, it would... Texas A&M and then the University of Florida would be the top two uh, universities as far as enrollment. But there's only four universities uh, that are members of the AAU and that's Vanderbilt, Missouri, Florida, and Texas A&M. Matter of fact, when I say that, A&M gave more to the SEC joining the SEC than the SEC gave to a and m and that was you were a member of the s of the aau you also brought more endowment than any other university in the sec and you also brought the largest stadium uh, of course you know uh, you got two other large stadiums alabama and tennessee but then you also brought 40% of their conference television package uh, of Dallas and Fort Worth. You know, the top five college football fan base television cities are is Birmingham and Atlanta. Birmingham's 85%, Atlanta's 41, Tampa, St. Pete's like 39, and then you have Dallas and, and Houston. Those are the top five. The reason 
that the big T the SEC, the Big Ten, the ACC have such a, a large uh, television package in the network, the SEC network, the Big Ten, the ACC network are a lot bigger than the Big 12 network and much bigger than the Pac-12. Matter of fact, in the Pac-12, the reason their network hasn't really came up or anywhere near the SEC network, there's only 14 to 17% of the, their whole footprint of the Pac-12 are college football fans where, I mean, you, you're up to, you know, 60, 50, and 60% in the SEC that are college football fans. Seems like everybody watches football in the SEC. Oh, yeah. Uh, now, you got to play for Bear Bryant, and you got the coach with Bear Bryant. Uh, I mean, just a, a legend of the game. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that, maybe some of the things you learned from him and some of the things? Well, there's, there's a lot of Aggies that uh, – uh, and especially the guys that went to Junction. Uh, but later in life, the, the Junction guys gave Coach Bryant a ring. And it was the only ring that he wore. Uh, up until that time, Coach Bryant would wear an A ring, which would a ring with A on it for Alabama. But when they gave him the Junction ring, that was the only ring Coach Bryant would wear. And, you know, his feelings for A&M went really deep, but feelings for the junction. Uh, did Coach Bryant, if, if he had to, had to do it over, if he had done his homework, I don't think he would have gone to junction. But, you know, Coach Bryant was never going to say he was wrong. And when he showed up and saw how bad it was, then – he was going to see it through. Uh, I don't know if anybody has ever uh, gone at all. Now, Bill has had seen barracks uh, like they had to sleep in the junction. And, you know, those barracks were hot, uh, no moving air in those barracks. So it wasn't a lot of fun for those players, but, uh, you know, the footprint that Coach Bryant left at a and is it was very, very huge. Uh, the players that he brought in, and some of the players, uh, you know, I don't know how many buses that he took. I think he took three buses uh, to Junction. Uh, the saying is that one came back, but, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. The guys that went could tell you, but the – you know, John David didn't go, Crow, he didn't go to Junction. Uh, Charlie Milstead, Coach Stallings, those guys, they were at Junction. And, but it made the football team. There's no question about it. And there was one player that was a great running back in one of the, he still is, one of the greatest running backs ever in the history of Texas, and that was Hall. And he came out of Sugar Land, Texas, and, but he didn't stay. Well, Junction was definitely a, uh, one, something that added, adds to A&M's legacy. Um, the 12th man kickoff team is, is another big uh, thing that is as part well, of our legacy, and, and you started that. Can you talk about uh, how, how, you, how that came about, where that came from, um, how you had that idea? Well, the 12th man uh, kickoff team came, I kept passing the bonfire, uh, you know, 12, 30, one o'clock when I get off, I'd pass by. So finally I stopped one night and all of a sudden they had me up on the four stack wiring logs, but it gave me an opportunity <clears throat> to really enjoy it because I for forgot about watching tape. I forgot about getting ready for the next opponent and I was up there enjoying and, and you know I was fortunate because the students came and got me and put me in all the things traditions of the students 
you know, from elephant walk to taps to, you know, the bonfire, I mean, on and on. And, but the night coming back and forth and then one night when I stopped, uh, they were passing the red pots and all the red pots understand. And if you've ever seen the passing of the red pots, uh, then you would understand. Uh, but could the first one, uh, they the red pots to be that were handpicked were on the four stack. There was a little 55 gallon drum with a fire and a little fire going and one of the red pots were beating the drum, 55 gallon drum with an ax handle. And I walked up and said, hello. And it was like, you know, who are you? And, but his attention was on the four stack. When he stopped beating the drum, the guys slid down the four stack, ran over in the first one, bent over and he took three slats. And then when you've had enough, you know, the word is or phrase, take your best shot. Well, that means you have one more slat left. And all of a sudden this was the fourth slat and the ax handle broke. So then he had to take three more slats. So that was seven slats. And I knew what that felt like. Because going through a club, I got slatted. And matter of fact, I had two slat, slats left, or we all did, and on Saturday morning. <clears throat> I took the first one, my knees hit the coat box, and I said, I ain't taking another one. And there's not anybody here big enough to make me either. And I walked out. And they said, Coach uh, Jackie said, you got to to get into the A club. And I said, I don't care. I'm not going to have another slat. Well, anyway, I knew what that felt like. And I, and here's a guy with no emotions. And I said, I can find 12 guys, you know, or the 11, uh, to run down on the kickoffs that had no regard for their body and crazy as hell, uh, would just die to get on Kyle field. And that's, I told the staff the next morning, and <clears throat> of course, they all thought I was crazy, uh, which probably was, but uh, RC said, Coach, I think you fell off that stack. You know, this ain't going to work, and but we made it work. And, you know, I tried it at Mississippi State, uh, but it, it, it did not work. It could work, and it did work at A&M, and it could work today because of out of that 59,000 students, you can find some guys with talent that and train them to cover kickoffs. Well, it worked out pretty good for your kickoff team. So weren't they ranked pretty high up in the country? And, well, and, for five years, they were in, in the top five, and two out of the five, they were number, number one in the nation. Their average was 12.5. But what's really neat about that, all those guys that were on the 12th man, they put a foundation together. Uh, they wrote a book, put a foundation together, and they give from the money raised and donated, they give scholarships. And I want to I want to say there are over a hundred and some odd thousand that they've given back to the university in scholarships for 12th man scholarships. A few years ago, we started a core scholarship. In other words, one of us would give four a year and one of them <clears throat> goes to a core member. So that's been a, a big plus for us. But again, the, you know, those guys on the 12th man, they earned their position and the dissolvement of the 12th man of, of, 11 guys out there at one time was the kickoff that was run back against A&M at Texas Tech. Uh, and RC dissolved the 12th man and only had started with one covering uh, kickoffs. Well, uh, you never want to give up a kick return, especially to Texas Tech, but... Uh... <laughs> no. <laughs> 
but it, it's uh, it's it's awesome to see the the legacy you've started every every week when when we've got a twelfth man running down the field making a big play and uh, you know look at uh, our last twelfth man he's he's been in the NFL or uh, Gillespie been he's in, been in the NFL two years now made the team for the Texans so well he was a really he, it's a it's a very uh, ideal because you have plenty of athletes like Gillespie that want to come to Texas A&M, want to be a part of A&M, and you have a lot of kids that want to be on the 12th man kickoff team or are, are a part of it. And so, you know, being that person uh, means an awful lot. Uh, if you don't understand as a coach, if you don't understand A and M, you're not going to win a championship because the power of the twelfth man, and I'm talking about the students and and the the former students, and it was just like this past week. You know, here's Dan Mullen is begging to open their stadium because of the sound in what the 12th man did to help A&M beat Florida. Now, when you have an opposing coach uh, with only 25% in the stadium saying, we need the whole stadium to compete with this. That, that is pretty, that's a, that's a good compliment from Dan Mullen. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to add that um, you know, just being at the game and watching how that unfolded. Frankly, uh, we were kind of subdued in the first quarter and the second quarter, and there were some yells. And you get, but the uh, basically the energy just started building and building, and it built up to the third into the third quarter. And by then, uh, through the fourth quarter, and I remember at one point in time, we had number five make that sack. And before that sack had occurred. I was watching, he was right below me, and he was just pacing back and forth. And he was just pumping himself up, and he was just popping in like this, and he was going and going and going. And next thing I know, like two players later, he went and made that sack, and my son turned to me and said, we're going to win this game. It was a momentum changer right there, number five. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's amazing how one play can flip a whole football game. And, you know, uh, number five is a pretty good player. <laughs> you know, hopefully, hopefully Bobby Brown. Hopefully Bobby Brown is okay. I know he tweeted oh, yeah. me a yeah. little bit. Um, well, you you got two players. You know Johnson and Jones. You know they had a heck of a game. You know Johnson had eleven solo tackles, and that's huge. But you know defensively, the guys up front, the linebackers, they played extremely well. And you talked about the the O line helping helping Kellen Mond. I, there was definitely something that went off in the third quarter. Those guys they started blowing Florida off the line pretty good, and that's when Spiller just took off and and took over. It takes a long time to build an offensive line because the cohesiveness of it is it's hard. You know, we talk about how mental a quarterback is, offensive lineman are a lot more mental than they are physical, although don't take the physicality out of it. But mentally, it's, it's one where you're having to pass off, you're having to, you know, deal with being able to, to uh, pass off the rush, but also pass off the blocking in and the, when you rush for 200 plus yards, uh, your offensive line is doing something in this, especially in the S SEC. It was, it was, it was fun to watch. Um, now you've, you know, you've, you've coached for, you coached for several different teams. Um, you've coached a lot of great players. Uh, you've had a lot of great assistants underneath you. Um, and you've proved yourself at every every team you've uh, coached for. You, you know you've won championships with every team, whether it was conference or national championships. Uh, what do you think it is that sets you apart that that gave you the edge with all your teams? Players, 
uh, you can't win without players. And, uh, you know, the, the ability, uh, the responsibility of a coach and I call it the four P's, uh, you know, you, you have to prepare your players mentally and physically. And, you know, coach Bryant, I'll never forget coach Bryant got on the blackboard one time and, and he put it at the top. He said, every team starts here every team goes down but the team that starts at the highest at mid-season is still higher and at the end of the year they're still higher and that is in their physical fitness their mental preparation uh, and then you come back uh, to the most uh, most important is is when you prepare mentally and physically and you practice and you know colonel general uh, can vouch for this you have to practice your team and if you don't put them in positions because if practice is not harder than the game you're not going to win the game and so Coach Bryant believed in that 100% where he, our practices were not very easy. And, you know, the, the players that played for me, uh, they probably didn't like me a lot of times you know, what we did in practice. But the third and the, and the most important is you put them in pos the right position. And you see this so often. And I'll go back to when we lost to Texas Tech, and then we came back and had Nebraska, and we lost to Nebraska, and this was when Fran was coaching, that our defensive back had speed, but he had no hips, meaning that he couldn't turn fast enough to not lose a step, and he should have played safety or played strong safety. But we lose at the end of the game, we lose to Texas Tech and we lose to Nebraska because we put a player in the wrong position and ask him to do something that he couldn't do. And that's the most important thing as a coach. If you're coaching a quarterback, you ask that quarterback and you got to know what he can do, but ask him only to do what he can do and the same thing with the rest of players if you have players that can play man play man if you have players that in the secondary that can't then don't play man so and then the fourth one is the one i always <laughs> laugh at after you do the first three and then the last one is get out of the way and let them perform because you see so many coaches that screw up a game either yelling at players or taking the attention or the players focus off of the game of what they should be doing and i go back uh, to the famous uh, uh, basketball coach of all time john wooden you never saw him ever say a word to his players or get off the the bench and coach bryant was like that Coach Bryant uh, never said a word to players on Saturdays uh, before the game or during the game, but after the game, you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, uh, we heard about it. But <clears throat> during the game, and you let the players perform. So get, getting out of the player's way and – and uh, being and coaching, coaching, being able to make adjustments as needed and get the players in the right position. Well, you got to put it. I mean, the game plan changes, and you know, football is not like a basketball. You throw a basketball down, it comes back to you. If you throw a football down, uh, however you have it positioned, it's either going to go right, left, forward, or back. And same thing. Uh, you never know in the game of football because you have to be prepared for everything that may, may happen. 
and I go back to Mississippi State, they lost the Arkansas game because they were not prepared for Arkansas to play that much zone as they played zone 100%, but they wasn't prepared for that in the first part of the game. Well, um, you, when you were a coach at a you had a pretty good record against TU. And, uh... <laughs> well, we played the first game. The second game was at Kyle Field in 90, I mean, in 82, you know, 83. And uh, at the end of the game, they started chanting what they always say, uh, poor Aggies, and I couldn't make it out. And I turned to Billy Pickard, and I said, Billy, what are they saying? And he said, Coach, they're saying poor Aggies. And I said, that's the last t damn time we're going to hear that. And it was. Y'all were, were able to beat them every time after that. Uh, now we saw from that point on, uh, that we won nine out of the ten years. So – it it flipped at that's, that time. That's pretty good. What do you think about? And I ask everybody this: What what do you think about uh, playing Texas again? We everybody, a I, lot of people are against it, but no, I play them in the parking lot. It doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, you're going to beat them, so play them. That's that's how I feel about it. I'm glad somebody's agreed with me finally. I'm 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 all for it. We sing the Warham every game, and it just makes me, you know, it just gets me fired up to about and remembering those games and how it doesn't matter what the record is, you you can redeem yourself with a win against them and and uh, you know. Well, the fans, the fans in the state of Texas uh, deserve this game. College football fans deserve this game. And there's no question that was one of the top games in the, in the country. That, that game actually started Thursday night ESPN. Wow. Oh, it, would be, it would be fabulous to, uh, to play them again and, and kick their ass. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Uh, so – we talked a little bit right before we started recording about Aggie Park and and uh, and how old Aggie Park is. You said it was uh, way older than me, which I agree with you, and and that there's a lot that went on before I was around. Uh, we're actually coming up on our 100th year as a park. Yeah, and, that's amazing. You know, if you can phantom 100 years of uh, people getting together. You know, it's, to me, it's a slide off of muster, you know, where you get together, you reminisce, and you tell old stories. Now, it's a hell of a lot better uh, when you win that week's game before you're a lot happier. So, you know, the next meeting, and I think Bill said when it will be, but the next meeting, hopefully we can continue to win and, and be very happy at the next meeting. Well, uh, def I hope so, too. That's uh, in a couple of weeks. So uh, we've got Mississippi State and then Arkansas uh, coming up. Can you, can you tell us about uh, any experiences you've had at Aggie Park or maybe your first time coming in uh, for a coach's night or for a golf tournament? Well, uh, I was very uh, – enthused but also I was very surprised of how many people showed up and when you think about that and, and you can multiply that out uh, the Aggie fingers reach a long ways and you know the the pride and it shows in that and I don't know I think Bill talked about it earlier uh, I don't know how much money uh, there is in, but how many scholarships y'all have put into a and and how many students y'all have been, uh, have put into a and and uh, the legacy goes on and on of the benefits of the people at Aggie Park. 
Well, we've been, we, we've been able to give over a million dollars total uh, in scholarships to students going to A&M. And right now we're giving uh, this past year $96,000 out to 12 students. So, and, I mean, that's, that's one thing that, sep that sets A&M apart from everywhere. I mean, I, it, let's just take in this state from Texas, from Baylor, from uh, TCU to Houston Tech. I don't and did research because I go speak at muster every year. And the one thing that always amazed me about Texas A&M, <clears throat> over seven, I want to say it's like 78% or maybe higher <clears throat> of the students at Texas A&M are on some type of financial need or assistance. That says a lot of the type of students that go to a and that really are thankful for somebody <clears throat> like Aggie Park of helping them go get a college degree. Where are you gonna be speaking for muster in 2021? I will be in a little town called Yoakum. Yoakum. I, I spoke there, and I, I've I've spoken every, uh, have uh, been to muster in, as a speaker from D.C. to Philly to California. I mean, L.A. to Denver, and I remember in Phoenix. I remember <laughs> one of the, uh, I've been to Yoakum before. I want to say ten years ago. And they somehow I got double booked. And I told the <laughs> club at Yoakum, I said, I'd rather be at Yoakum in a small town than a major city. So, uh, you know, and they raised quite a bit of money. Uh, you know, all the things that we do, <clears throat> I'm talking about former students, the 12th Man Foundation, uh, 12th Man Kickoff Team Foundation. There's one thing that's, that everybody has in common, and that is helping students go to a and and helping former Aggies in any need that they have. Well, we, we definitely try to do our part in, uh, in to raise money and help kids continue to have the opportunity to go to Texas A&M. And uh, it's something we're real proud of in San Antonio. Um, Bill, I know, you know, you class of 84, you know, right in the middle of Coach Cheryl winning championships. You, do you have any questions? You got anything you want to ask Coach Cheryl? I mean, this, you know. No, I, I don't. I don't think I have a question. Uh, it was uh, coach. You did a great job of laying that out. But just, I'll just uh, just say how exciting it was to be a student. You know, in that transition where Jackie came in and he uh, then took over, and then just the whole leadership. You know, the basic definition of leadership is to influence change, and the uh, change in that program. And then how that program in the football, I'm talking about the football program, uh, then uh, expanded to throughout the entire university was phenomenal. And uh, I know that uh, we were blessed to have you for, for a number of years and a number of generations of Aggies that went in through there. And, uh, you know, your, your, your words were very wise uh, today. Thank you very much. And, uh, it's just been a pleasure growing up being an Aggie uh, uh, when you were the coach and then just seeing how you've continued to be an Aggie and support Aggies for years and years to come. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. And, you know, there's a lot of things that we started and that I feel very, very uh, proud about. And one of them is we always went to the children's hospitals, uh, but talking about the Cotton Bowl, uh, we started the children's visit at the Cotton Bowls, and we were the first team to actually go to the Scottish Rite and 
from that point on, they always involved both teams to go visit not only the Children's Hospital, but the Scottish Rite as well. And, you know, that legacy that A&M and the players, because how they re- interacted and reacted uh, with the kids in need, and especially the handicapped kids, uh, says a lot or said a lot. And I always did that. I never knew, uh, and I started it in the 70s, as a matter of fact, 77, uh, going to bowl games and taking the players. And I, the first time, I never asked any of the players uh, that they had to go. I said, we're, bus is going to leave at a certain time, and we're going, and this is what we're going to do. You know, we'll give hats, T-shirts, other things to the kids. I just wanted to see who would get on the bus. And the meanest, the nastiest, the, and I'm talking about on the field, toughest players were always the first on the bait of the bus, and they always were the best in the hospitals with the kids. And, I mean, he, you can picture Ray Childers, how big he was when he would go into the room and you got a six five guy, six six, uh, looking down at a at a, maybe a, a four foot child, and you know here's the giant coming in, but the giant was very mellow and really related extremely well to the players. So I mean, there's there's a lot of things that, and you being a student at A&M that time, I don't know if our students today understand how much fun it was in the 80s of being a student. Bill, how, how fun was it? And, and real quick, did you try out for the kickoff team? Well, I did not try out for the football team. I think I weighed all of about 145 pounds at that point in time. <laughs> but uh, – Talk about fun. I mean, I was in the Corps Cadets. A lot of folks were in different organizations. And, uh, you know, I actually didn't want to join the Corps Cadets. I've told this a few times. But I got there from day one, and it was so much fun. And the fellowship that we had, and I saw the same thing in the uh, non-reg dorms and the intramurals that were played and the different events that went on, the camaraderie across the entire university was brought together, and the spirit of A&M was fantastic. And you're, you're right. These students these days do an incredible amount of things, and they have a lot of opportunities. And we are we're blessed today. They are they, they, this next generation is going to be just fine. But you know, some of us we grew up in the in the school of hard knocks, and we grew together, and uh, we embodied the uh, spirit and those traditions and values of A and M. And hopefully, I think I see, and I actually not hopefully I see it being passed on these days to our current students. I'm sure proud of them. Uh, and that, there's no question. There, there's other things that have stood out. One, uh, the first year we go to the Cotton Bowl, uh, students, they were going to be able to allocation of X number of student tickets. So the students in, started on Friday night, and they were in tents in front of G. Riley White. Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, Sunday. And because the windows opened, I think at eight o'clock Monday morning. But what got my attention was the tickets were sold by nine o'clock. And at nine o'clock, you didn't even know anybody was in that area. All the tents were gone all the trash, everything was picked up and clean. And that wouldn't happen at other places. Those trash cans must have been overflowing with beer bottles. (laughs) I wasn't going to say that now, (laughs) (laughs) Logan. (laughs) Well, Coach, uh, we really really appreciate you joining us for our uh, virtual Monday lunch, and we hope to get things back – to normal and would love to have you down to the park. And um, well, I need to come back because there's a lot of old guys there. I need to 
say hello to. And one of my special friends is Paul, uh, as you know, and uh, I miss seeing him. But uh, Bill, if if you and, and Logan, if you will email me your address, uh, I will send you a 12th man a book autographed. Hey, we, we really appreciate that. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you very much, Coach, and thanks for all you do, Gigan. Well, thank you for what you have done in your service. And hell yeah, Gigan. <laughs> all right, I'll beat the hell out of Mississippi State next week. Uh, I tell you what, uh, it's. I think this past week with Florida helped the players understand what it takes, but the en enjoyment of winning. Uh, so personally, I think that this is going to be a stepping stone for things really to bounce forward. If well, I, Spiller, hope uh, if, I, I tell you what, if Spiller runs like he ran last week, uh, uh, we're going to beat a lot of people. Well, I, I hope you're right. And, uh, and thank you very much again and look forward to seeing you. Okay, thank you. All righty, y'all take care.